Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Sejan Kim and I'm the program officer of the CLS program at American Councils for International Education. And today I'm excited to host this webinar to highlight our Japanese program and also grateful to be joined by two alumni ambassadors of the program, Bridget and Kian. Bridget, could you uh, briefly introduce yourself, please? Hi everyone, my name is Bridget. Um, I'm a current senior at Loyola Marymount University and I was able to do CLS in the summer of 2019. Wonderful, thank you for joining us today, Bridget. Next we have Kian. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Kian Thomas. I'm currently a senior at the University of Florida um, and very glad to be here talking with you guys today. And like Bridget, I'm a 2019 CLS alumni. Wonderful, thank you for joining. All right, so moving on. Um, I hope everyone can see uh, the screen sharing here. So in today's presentation, we will start with an overview of the CLS program, including some more specific details about our Japanese program. And then we will hear from Bridget and Kian about their experiences on the program. Uh, and at the end, we will answer any questions that you have about the CLS program and application process. And we'll be answering questions entered in the Q&A box here in Zoom. So you're welcome to add any questions there at any time throughout the presentation. And then we'll answer those that aren't addressed in the presentation once we're through with our slides. So the CLS program is a fully funded summer study abroad program and it, supported, it supports US students in all fields of study to learn what the US Department of State refers to as critical languages. And Japanese is one of the 15 languages offered through the CLS program. Now, probably the most exciting thing about the CLS program is that it is fully funded by the US government. Uh, the program covers domestic travel from each participant's home in the US to Washington DC for a pre-departure orientation, as well as round trip international travel to your program site. The program also covers applicable visa fees, as well as cost of tuition, room and board, culture excursions, and activities in the host country. And alum, uh, alumni of the program receive undergraduate credit through Rimmar College, as well as certified ACFL OPI, which is a oral proficiency interview test score, and certificate to verify their language progress. So I know everyone here uh, are interested, of course, uh, in uh, the Japanese program and have invested some time in studying uh, the Japanese language, but I would like to um, share with you a little bit more about why Japanese. Um, Japan has been known for decades as one of the world's leading cultural, technological, and economic hubs, and the combination of millennia old traditions and stunning innovations across countless different fields is fascinating for many students. Um, so learning Japanese offers not only the opportunity to experience firsthand the beautiful culture and people of Japan, but it will also help you build a career around its long-standing social and economic importance worldwide. Um, and learning Japanese language and culture will give you a competitive edge among Americans seeking to engage in East Asia's booming global market. Um, in addition, Japanese language proficiency and cultural knowledge will give you the ability to form successful cross-cultural partnerships with Japanese people and in the fields of study as diverse as architecture, politics, medicine, and literature. Um, now, the CLS program for Japanese is open to students at approximately the intermediate level through the advanced level. And to be eligible for Japanese, students are required to have completed the equivalent of two academic years of prior study at the university level. While many students meet these requirements through formal classes at college level, you may substitute other language learning experiences for formal classes, such as self-study, tutoring, high school coursework, or the knowledge of language from your home environment. Um, there is a space in the application for you to describe your experience and how it meets proficiency requirements for the level to which you're applying. And in any case, you must have a plan to meet the requirement by the beginning of June when the CLS program starts. So it would be 2021 June if you're applying for this fall. Um, previous study does not need to appear on your academic transcript, but you do need to be at the appropriate level. And it is in your benefit not to try to game the system. 
Uh, we have tips on our website uh, on the FAQ page uh, in terms of how to determine what level you should apply to based on your experience. So we encourage you to have a look at our website. In addition, CLS participants, when they arrive at the host country, they take a placement test on site and groups are structured based on the assessment made by our partner institute staff, which may not necessarily correspond to your own self-assessed level on the application. Oh, familiar face, yay. <laughs> Keep in mind that CLS program is more than just a funding opportunity. It is an all-inclusive study abroad program focused on immersive language learning. So each of our partner institutes host up to about 30 CLS scholars and facilitates an intensive eight-week program for students that includes 20 classroom hours or language instructions each week, cultural activities, local excursions, and one or two weekend overnight trips. The program is academically challenging, and I'm sure Kian and Bridget will have something to add to that. And every aspect is designed to maximize your language gains and your immersion in the uh, host culture. And throughout the summer, students agree to speak only in the target language they're studying. And even if they are um, absolute beginners, but for Japanese, there is no absolute beginner. So we jump right into studying in Japanese as the program starts. Um, each student is assigned a language partner to, for practice outside of classroom. Um, so let's start with maybe Kian first. Um, Kian, if you could tell us a little bit about your experience with the language policy, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So this is a, a key feature of the CLS program for sure. Um, you know, one of the things about the language policy is when you're traveling on your own, um, even if you, you know, really do your best to try and remain disciplined and always, you know, speak the language in the context environment, you're not really going to have uh, any rules or anybody, you know, to, to hold you accountable for doing so. Um, you know, if you were to say, uh, try and, and do that on your own, uh, but the CLS program kind of does that for you. Um, and while it's a, it's a pretty strict policy, um, I came to appreciate it. And actually, I, I really, you know, was looking forward to it, um, you know, given I had traveled to Japan before that and, you know, had not had as much success, um, you know, kind of trying to, to remain disciplined in that way while my friend was actually doing CLS Korean. And I could see how much he was improving in his Korean skills just by virtue of being sort of, you know, held accountable to, to this strict policy. And you know, it, it really is, it really is strict and sometimes it can be, it can be tough, but, you know, it's important to, to remember why, why you're in the program, you know, um, you're going to be challenged, you will be, uh, you know, around people speaking English at times, um, you know, you will come home, as one person said at our pre-departure orientation, you'll come home some days so tired that you don't even want to speak English or you can't even speak English at that point, um, even if you wanted to. So, um, overall, you know, the point of the program, it's, it's good to remember why you're there. Um, and the point of the program is to strengthen your language skills and, you know, the, the way CLS successfully packs eight weeks of language instruction into one year um, it is partially through implementation of the language uh, program. So, you know, um, as Sejong will tell you and like as everyone else at CLS will tell you, like, at the end of the day, it's really there for your benefit. It's really there to help you out. And, um, you know, it, it, it's really, you know, the, the best way to, to approach it is to put your best foot forward and really challenge yourself to always speak Japanese and never break out of that. And it will become comfortable to you uh, faster than you think is sort of my take on it. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Bridget, do you have anything to add? I think Kian covered really like a lot of what I wanted to say. Um, like, yes, it's definitely difficult, but I think it was super beneficial and like your confidence in speaking the language improves um, and you yourself like improve as well. Um, also, even though it's like strict, like when it's not as if you like can't like text your family in English or like text your like friends back home, like to let you know, let them know like how you're doing. Um, and then also I think one other part of it that can make it difficult is sometimes like like people are talking about something in Japanese and you really want to say something and you know you can say it in English but you just can't convey it right in Japanese or like when you feel like you can't express yourself the way you want to in Japanese um, are some of the things that might make it a little bit difficult but overall I felt like it was really beneficial and it definitely helps people improve a lot. 
Yes, I, I think I can agree to you in terms of feeling like that wall uh, on expressing things, not as you don't sound like a college student in your second or the foreign language. Uh, and then there's definitely a barrier where you are not as funny or intelligent, sounding intelligent as you are in English, right? Um, and that, that could be a little bit challenging. Uh, but for sure, many of our alumni did say that that little uh, extra push, push and nudge uh, to have you accountable for your own language learning by uh, um, adhering to language policy really help them to sort of move away from that, you know, bubble of study abroad sometimes uh, that ha happens. So you're in a study abroad program, but you're with a number of different um, students who come from similar first language background and you end up spending a lot more time bonding with them, which is great. Uh, but all of the time that you're spending to bond with them, then in turn uh, sort of takes away your opportunity to be out there and, you know, somehow, some way use the circumlocution to, um, you know, upgrade your uh, language ability. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for sharing uh, your perspectives, uh, Kian and uh, Bridget. All right. Now, um, depending on, I know this is a big question, we might already have this question in our Q&A box, but depending on health and safety considerations, I want to just share up front that it may be necessary to hold some or all of the 2021 CLS Institutes virtually. And in that case, virtual instructions would follow for a similar structure, uh, emphasizing use of the language, cultural learning, and building relationship between our scholars and the people of host country. Um, in 2019, when Kian and Bridget was on the program, the CLS program was hosted by Okayama University in Okayama, Japan. Okayama is the capital city of Okayama Prefecture in Chukoku region, um, and it is located in the western part of Honshu in Japan, and it's home to Korakuen, which is one of Japanese, um, one of Japan's top three traditional gardens. Um, Okayama is playing an important role in supporting sustainable development goals and practices in Japan, and you will have many opportunities to learn about the importance of these uh, two people who are in the host community throughout the program. Okayama University has also a very long history dating back to 1870 when it was originally founded as medical school. And then in 1949, OU was designated as a national university with 11 departments and six graduate schools. And often referred to as Okadai in the local society, of course. Uh, Okayama University follows the footsteps of educational heritage by Shizutani School, which is the oldest school in Japan built for citizens by Lord Okayama in Edo period. Um, there will be a variety of culture excursions on the program and typically two excursions locally and one overnight excursion for a more distant destination. And an example of an excursion is shown here where students visited Inujima Island uh, and had an opportunity to learn about how the ruins of old copper refinery in that island um, remains historically significant to the members of that island. They visited a museum of art and had discussions with the experts during the excursion as well. And other culture activities may involve special lecture on an event uh, that has historic or cultural significance in the host community or learning sato, which is traditional Japanese tea ceremony. All right, um, so for the CLS Japanese Institute, language partners are typically Japanese students who are studying at the host institution uh, that hosts CLS programs, so it would be Okadai students uh, for Okayama. And in some instances, these may be students who are interested in teaching Japanese in the future, while others uh, may be just students of varying study backgrounds. Typically, CLS students will be matched with language partners according to the common interest uh, to the degree that is possible. Um, students will stay in dorms and be socializing with Japanese speaking resident assistants uh, that agree to speak exclusively in Japanese with them. And then students will have opportunity for uh, host family visits on the weekend. And many students report that the resident assistants and host family experiences as one of the most valuable uh, part of the program. Uh, and students spend a significant portion of their out of class time with their RAs and host families. And then common activities include um, enjoying together watching TV or movies in the common area, cooking and sharing meals, of course, going on walks around the neighborhood, and even celebrating events together like birthdays. Um, Kian and Bridget, actually Bridget first, perhaps, um, could you share a little bit about your living arrangement in Okayama? Yes, so we lived in a dorm. Um, and there was the common area where we could interact with like 
the cohort and then also the resident assistants. So we definitely do some of the things you mentioned before, like we could cook together. Um, we could also study together. Um, and then sometimes when it got late at night, we do like karaoke together too. Um, yeah. So it was like, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, and then we did have a host family um, that we went on a few day trips with. And then we also spent a weekend at their house. Um, I had a lot of fun with my host family. Um, my host mother's cooking was amazing. And it was really like fun to talk to like the middle school and high school student. So, but was yeah. It, yeah, was it a little bit different, I guess, uh, speaking style or register when you talk with the uh, language partner and host family and, uh, sorry, resident <laughs> assistants compared to class? Yes, um, I think, Definitely for the host family, like talking to like your teacher in class or talking to like a university like language partner is a lot different from talking to a middle schooler. Um, so it's definitely like you get to like learn new things and like um, experience like talking to like a variety of people um, and it's super beneficial, I guess, to like language learning. That's great. Um, Kian, I, I featured your picture, one of your picture. <laughs> uh, but if you don't mind sharing a little bit about the uh, living situation uh, from your perspective. Yeah, um, so uh, Bridget hit a lot of it right on the money. Um, basically, we, uh, you know, we had a sort of hybrid situation is what I call it, wherein, you know, most of the time we resided in dorms. Um, and, you know, with RA sort of guiding our experience and you know, that was a major highlight of the whole thing, because as Bridget said, you know, we enjoyed uh, karaoke with them some evenings. And, you know, uh, as Sejong mentioned, like, you know, we, we would cook together and, you know, go go on strolls around the neighborhood. And honestly, you know, the extent to which they made themselves available for us was absolutely incredible. And they really just became part of this, you know, sort of I mean, they became part of the cohort and we, we we're all still, you know, pretty close. And uh, actually two weeks ago, you know, um, the RAs joined us for, you know, our weekly uh, conversation tables that we have. Um, and, and so that was a major highlight of it. But also the, you know, as Bridget kind of touched on, um, you know, you, you really, this situation where, you know, we got to see our host family some weekends and, you know, um, you know, spend a lot of time experiencing uh, student dorm life as well gave us a pretty decent balance uh, between interacting with different people and, you know, in certain situations, you know, because of uh, seniority systems in Japan, um, it, it was a good way to sort of get exposure to uh, speaking to different groups of people and, you know, in some cases, uh, practicing Kago or at least seeing how it works. Um, and, you know, that was a whole nother aspect of it. But all in all, it was a great experience. Um, you know, same, my host family also had amazing cooking um, and they were, they, you know, just like the RAs went out of their way to, you know, um, make me feel comfortable, make us feel comfortable. And, uh, you know, I, I think it was an incredible experience. We're all still in touch today. So if that says anything about that. <laughs> that is wonderful. I know uh, the cohort and also the, everyone, uh, their connection with the uh, host con community continues after the program, which is pretty amazing. All right. Um, so, in addition to the opportunity to study abroad and take language classes on a fully funded program, I think there are lots of benefits that come from participating on the program. And students on CLS make substantial gains in language proficiency over the course of one summer. Um, and proficiency in a critical language definitely opens door to few, uh, further academic or employment opportunities in all fields. Um, and studying abroad can also help you develop and hone in skills that all employers are looking for, the soft skills such as problem solving, flexibility, adaptability, and so forth. Um, and all of these things will help you stand out uh, to employers to give you an edge in an increasingly competitive and globalized job market. And because of the immersive nature of CLS program, participants also have unique opportunities to build meaningful relationship in the host communities. Wait, we just talked about this, right? And um, with friends and colleagues from the host country and peers and their CLS cohort who come from all over the US. And so yeah, pictured here is uh, Bridget and Kian's cohort right there. And everybody comes from every imaginable corner of the United States. Um, so I think it was probably a fun experience for them to meet with each other as much as they were connecting to host, con uh, host um, community. And then alumni of the program join a vibrant and engaged community of U.S. Department of State International Exchange alumni, which is a larger body of alumni of everyone who had been participating in the U.S. Department of State programs and gain access to resources and events supported by the CLS program. 
And while CLS participants have no service commitments to the U.S. government after completion of the program, alumni do receive a certificate of non-competitive eligibility for federal employment. Um, and if you have any questions about this particular status, we can uh, discuss further in the Q&A section. Uh, but basically, it gives you an edge in terms of, you know, seeking for employment with the government, not that you have to work for the government for receiving the scholarship, if that makes sense to you. All right, so our application is currently open and online uh, right now at clscholarship.org slash apply. Uh, and in order to prepare for a competitive application, we definitely recommend you starting early and reaching out to resources on your campus for help. Uh, there's even a search box to find that resource on your campus um, in our website. So definitely search uh, and seek that out. Um, the application deadline is November 17, 2020 at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and that's 5 p.m. Pacific Time. You may apply for one language, so it would be for those who are interested in Japanese, you would be applying for Japanese language um, and not selecting two, three other languages that you might be also interested if you know you don't get the scholarship for Japanese. So please keep that in mind when you're applying for the, the program that you're applying for a language. Uh, and applicants are required to submit an unofficial transcript and one recommendation, four short essays and a statement of purpose form. Uh, uh, that Those are the uh, core of the application and these essays, um, the length is generally other than the statement of purpose, 300 words-ish. Um, so those are all short essays. Um, now, Kian and Bridget, you guys were there as applicants in the fall, so um, if you have any specific tips for application, I know Kian has a very concrete tip I actually uh, heard about uh, before joining this webinar, so Kian, why don't you start? Sure, so um, two things I would say. One, touching on the essays, and this is something, you know, the, the CLS crew, I think, would definitely emphasize and has emphasized to us in the past is uh, be authentic in your essays. Um, you know, there's this tendency, I feel like a lot of people have to, you know, sort of appeal to the State Department affiliation CLS has uh, and, you know, claim in their essays that they aspire to become a foreign service officer. And, you know, that's great if you actually want to be a foreign service officer. But, you know, I think CLS is really looking for concrete ways that the program can help you achieve your particular goals. And so, if you're not actually aiming to do that or you know you can't actually put yourself in that position to to see yourself doing that and you know conceptualize how japanese specifically would help you get there um it might show in your essays and inauthenticity tends to tends to um you know sh sh uh, reveal itself so that's one thing i would mention about the essays is just uh, be authentic in your intentions um and how you think the program can help you um, and the other thing, which is a really big thing for me, um, when I got back from the program, uh, you know, I had opted in prior to entering the program to get academic credit. And when I got back, I realized that, you know, I had failed to, you know, go through this process that was required by my university to go to the international center and, you know, get my study abroad approved so that my credits could be approved, uh, you know, upon my return. Uh, luckily, they were able to retroactively uh, register me and, uh, um, you know, uh, approve of my study abroad program, but uh, that's the penalties for that had they not gone ahead and, you know, approved my study abroad program, at least at my university, are, are harsh and severe because if you opt in for academic credit and it's unable to be uh, accounted for or officially reported, um, at least at my university, you know, you, you might not be able to graduate. Um, on that end. And that's, uh, you know, especially if you're a rising senior or you just graduated and you went on the program and you opted for academic credit yet failed to go through the right, you know, offices at your university to, to make sure that, you know, that credit can, can be uh, officially received and accounted for once you return, then, um, you know, you might be in a lot of trouble. And that's something I would definitely implore all of you to pay special attention to um, because you don't want to face that stress uh, or you know any of the possible repercussions that could come from that if you choose to opt for academic credit. So that's kind of my two cents. 
Thank you very much, Kian. We actually had those questions in the different information sessions, so it's really helpful to hear from right from the source. And I'm, I'm sorry that you had to go through that, but I'm glad also that you were able to have that uh, retroactively, you know, confirmed that, that you can have those credits. So that's wonderful. Yeah, each school have a very particular and specific offices involved. For example, Kian mentioned that his international student, uh, you know, in, uh, study abroad program was involved. Some schools might have registrar's office also involved. Some school might have your academic advisor signature needed before you go on the program for it to be for your requested credit to be, you know, transferred after the program. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty, um, I would say, um, a detailed process. So yeah, indeed, uh, in spring, if you are accepted and um, also opting in to request a credit, academic credit, then definitely uh, there are a few um, checkboxes um, that you want to mark off. Okay, Bridget, do you have anything to add for application tips? Uh, yeah, so for me, I feel like when you're writing like the essays, um, you should definitely get other people to read over it and give you feedback. I feel like my first draft for sure would not have gotten me the scholarship, but I think it's because like I showed it to people, I got their feedback, I like fixed my grammar, um, and then I thought about like their impressions reading my application and that's what really helped me to make like a good application. Also, I had the chance to like edit some applications for this upcoming cycle. Um, and one of the things that I think you should think about when you're writing your application is that if you claim things like you're claiming that you stay level headed under pressure, you're claiming that you can adapt to any situation or that you're flexible, you should probably back it up with some kind of example because I think it's great to have those things. But if you don't like say how you sh say how you showed those things, um, it's not as convincing. Plus, uh, one other thing to try to avoid um, is having redundancy in answering the essay questions. I definitely was super redundant in my first draft, um, but you should try to have like show different parts of yourself in like each um, essay answer, I guess. Um, and yeah, essentially that's my advice for the application. Yeah, thank you. Those are all very practical. And I think it's great that you're sharing also your um, experience of sort of looking at other people's application and helping them out and then sort of seeing it in an objective uh, perspective. I think one aspect of application writing is that certainly you, you know, you know yourself best. But also you'll be surprised how well people around you know you to pinpoint and say, hey, in terms of resiliency, you didn't you do this, you should probably plug this in to back up that argument that you're resilient. Um, you might have that uh, friends and family, uh, you know, chiming in, uh, which will eventually be a very um, helpful way to solidify your uh, application and maintaining it authentic, as Kian mentioned, uh, instead of it sounding uh, superficial or more of like a poster child version of them, or what you think is a poster child of CLS applicant. Okay, moving forward. Now's the uh, fun, I think more fun and interesting time to uh, hear from our alumni on their experiences. So Bridget, take it away. Okay, so first I'm gonna start by talking about my personal like favorite memory um, from CLS. Um, it was the time when I had the chance to visit the hometown of one of our resident assistants during a free day. Um, so it, at the dorm, uh, there were four Okayama University students who served as resident assistants and during one free day me and another member of the cohort had a chance to go with one of our resident assistants to her home prefecture Kagawa. Um, the pictures in the lower left corner um, but yeah we got to go uh, we got to visit a famous shrine called Kompita-san and we got to hike up all the stairs um, and then we got to try like local specialties like OED ice which is what we are holding up in the picture um, and also udon and it was just like a super special experience um, and I really enjoyed it a lot. Um, so next, I'm going to talk a bit about why I decided to participate in CLS in the first place. So I decided to participate because I wanted to improve my Japanese. Um, and I realized that during an info session, much like this one, I actually had all the requirements to apply for this scholarship. Um, and then also one of my motivations for studying Japanese in the first place is that my grandma is Japanese. Um, so I had been studying it since high school. And even though I only had one year of Japanese study in college, I had four in high school. So I was able to use that for the two year requirement. Um, additionally, for me, at least, um, I'm majoring in computer science and animation. Um, so it, for me, I like, there was no exchange, exchange school connected to my school that would offer those courses in Japan. Um, so 
I was like really excited for CLS as a chance to like improve my language ability quickly. Um, while also the fact that it was like during the summer, so I wouldn't like fall behind on my like coursework or like have to graduate late or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I really jumped at this opportunity. Um, and when I was applying, I guess my career and academic goals were to like improve my Japanese to the level where I could use it in the workplace to maybe like try to get like internships um, at like maybe like a tech company that like uses Japanese or and to also go to grad school um, to study in a program like in Japanese, I guess. Um, and then like my long term goal, um, I'm from Hawaii. So I really wanted to like improve my Japanese so eventually that I could come back home and help like local businesses um, with like their like websites and software, um, but also to help them to like cater to like Japanese like tourists and customers because like there's a lot of like Japanese people in Hawaii and there's a lot of like connections to Japan. So like knowing Japanese would be like super beneficial there. Um, so that was like my long term goals. Um, they have changed slightly or they haven't really changed, but they've been definitely pushed back. I think one of the <laughs> notions I had going into CLS was like, okay, I'll just like study super hard for eight weeks and then somehow I'll be fluent. That is not the case. I definitely improved, but I'm still not fluent. Um, so I'm still working on that. Um, if you're thinking like me and you're thinking, okay, I'll do this program and then I'll be fluent. Unless you're like already kind of fluent, that probably won't be the case for you like it was for me. Um, but yeah, and then, to end with some of the benefits of the program, it's an immersive program. You have the language policy to really like, like encourage you to like practice your skills every day. Um, and it really helps for like a rapid increase in like confidence using the target language because you you're using it every day for like basically all the time. So then even if you like don't feel confident at first, like you feel a little embarrassed, like speaking Japanese or something, you won't feel embarrassed by the end of this program. Um, and then also I think the people are a real part of what makes this program and experience really great from like the CLS like staff here in the US to like the people like running the program at Okayama University to your cohort to resident assistants, host family, language partners, everybody's like really great and it's like also for the cohort it's so nice to meet people who are also passionate about the target language and come from a variety of places and backgrounds in the US. Um, and also the fact that it's fully funded with a stipend is a game changing benefit. So um, yeah, if you're even like slightly interested, I would definitely apply to this program. Thank you, Bridget. Um, all right, moving on to uh, the next slide, Wakeen story. All right, <laughs> yes. So, um, well, uh, I, I think Bridget, um, Bridget's part was amazing. Um, I'll try to follow up appropriately. Uh, so favorite memory from the program is what I'm gonna start with, uh, which is, a, it's a hard question, right? Because there were, there's so much that happened in those eight weeks and so many uh, incredible relationships made. And, uh, you know, um, as you can see in that bottom middle picture, you know, that was taken only about a couple months ago, I guess now. And that's our, our conversation table um, with everyone from our cohort. and. Uh, some of the previous staff from Okayama University, uh, you know, so that just really goes to show how much, uh, you know, how many relationships we made and, you know, all, all that. But I would say the, one of the highlights of the trip was definitely, um, you know, as portrayed in the bottom right, uh, you know, going to those rice fields, um, you know, far outside of, uh, decently far outside of Okayama city um with my friend and his host dad uh well, one of our uh you know one of my fellow uh cohort mates i guess and uh it was a pretty surreal experience not only because you know to see these you know mountainsides uh you know and, and rice paddies that you only see in in photos and things like that um in real life and to just walk through it um you know, it was pretty surreal. But we also, not only that, we also got to plant, <laughs> we also got to plant some rice uh, shortly after this picture was taken and, uh, you know, just experience that and have, you know, uh, and the farmer who hosted us had, uh, you know, fresh food and, uh, and plum juice ready for us. And it was just an incredible, incredible experience. Um, and especially, I believe that was on a Sunday. So right after a hard week of, uh, you know, uh, studying hard and, 
you know, um, all of that. It, it was a great way to, to unwind and just realize like, wow, I'm in Japan um, and, you know, uh, around great people. And um, yeah, so that, that was certainly a highlight for me. Um, as for why I decided to participate in the CLS program, um, same as Bridget. Um, I wanted to improve my Japanese and I feel like that's uh, uh, pretty much a commonality between all of us who did the CLS program in Japanese or in other programs. Um, and, you know, really what I wanted to, to do was, um, you know, I, I wanted to improve it and put it to the test, um, you know, outside the bounds of, you know, the, the rather small Japanese studies um, bubble that we sort of have at, at my university. Um, which is a great community, but, you know, I really felt that I wasn't being, um, you know, uh, challenged enough or that, you know, I, I could be challenged more. Um, and more specifically, I, I wanted to, you know, go and for the first time really apply my two years of studies, study, um, you know, in context uh, and really get a better gauge as to where I was at, um, you know, uh, proficiency wise, which, you know, kind of like Bridget was saying, you go into it thinking you're going to come out, um, you know, amazingly fluent. And um, while that's not true, um, you get a gauge for where you really are and where you need, how far you need to go to gain that level of proficiency uh, you, you'll think you'll come out of the program with. And, uh, um, you know, that was really helpful in, in just, you know, not only realizing that, but in general, also, you know, moving up a level. I mean, that's exemplified by the OPI exams you take at the beginning and end of the program, um, as well as, you know, the, for me, the midterm and final exams, specifically the oral exams we had with our uh, senseis, you know, really helped sort of, you know, show our knowledge because our teachers, you know, who were there with us throughout the whole journey, you know, could kind of, uh, pinpoint things at, at the midterm and say, hey, you need to improve upon, you know, these aspects of your speaking. And, you know, by the time you come around to the final, while they still have critiques, you know, at least in my case, Sensei was, uh, you know, saying, oh, you sound a lot more comfortable speaking Japanese. You don't sound as nervous. You know, you, you're really, you know, just uh, being more casual about it. And you, you're not as afraid, kind of like what Bridget was saying. Um, and so I feel like the program was really effective in doing that um, and just giving me an idea of how, how long the road ahead is and, uh, you know, what I need to do from, from that point in order to, what I needed to do from that point in order to, to actually make the improvements I wanted to make. Um, and, you know, overall, I wanted to, you know, make those improvements for, you know, my, my career goal, which at the time, as I, you know, I mentioned the foreign service earlier, at the time, I was really fascinated with the foreign service um, and felt that uh, Japanese language ability, um, you know, would not only, you know, help me give, get that, you know, particular edge, perhaps in, um, you know, uh, applying and perhaps one day becoming a, um, a foreign service officer, but also could uh, help place me in Japan at a time when, um, you know, the demographic landscape is changing a lot. And, you know, there's going to be uh, an increasing need for, um, you know, foreign workers in Japan one way or another, um, you know, just based on, on how things are changing. Um, but, you know, since that time, I think my goals have, have changed a little bit, kind of like Bridget, you know, they've been uh, pushed back a little bit. And, you know, like many who enter the foreign service, uh, I think I want to, you know, take a different route in the meantime. Um, so currently I'm studying for the LSAT, which is uh, arduous work, but I'm hoping to go to law school, um, uh, you know, and study international law. Um, so maybe one day, you know, I can apply uh, my Japanese to that in one way or another, hopefully in service to the United States, whether through the civil or foreign service and uh, eventually, um, you know, fill, fill some sort of niche um, in that regard. Um, and, you know, uh, we'll see what happens, but that's sort of how my career trajectory has changed a little bit. Um, and I kind of already touched on the benefits of the program. Um, you know, it, it really gave me that challenge that I was looking for. Um, and, uh, you know, provided me the opportunity to, to also see other American students and, you know, where their levels were at and, you know, um, get an idea of, you know, like I, like I keep saying, just where I needed to be. Um, and at the end of the day, 
it, it was uh, it was just an incredible experience, and the benefits go far beyond the program. Like I said, we're all still in touch. I mean, I'm uh, you know Bridget's on this call now. I, I'm calling another uh, member of the cohort later to interview them for one of my classes. Um, you know, it, it, it's just the the benefits extend long beyond uh, you know long after the program ends, and uh, all in all, um, it was definitely one of the highlights of my life so far. Um, which is a dramatic statement, but absolutely true. Um, and, uh, and yeah, um, wouldn't have traded it for the world. Definitely recommend you guys apply. Thank you so much, Kian, for sharing those. Um, and just to add a little bit, you know, Kian had one specific idea about career and how he would use the language and culture after he came back home at the application, point of application. And it's totally okay. And it's very natural for you to have a new perspective on things and go about and do something different than what you have, um, you know, jot down on the application. We're not going to chase you down and say, hey, Kian, you said you want to be a foreign service officer. Why aren't you doing that? Um, so, so yes, um, it's just the application process itself is a way to sort of explore different options that you might have considered in the past, but more in depth. Um, so at this point, I'm sure many of you are wondering ideal candidates, right? Who are they? Um, including Kian and Bridget, because there I, I saw a Q&A box, like how did you make your application stand out? Um, so I'm going to just walk a little bit through these. Um, so successful applicants for CLS, they come from a wide range of backgrounds for sure. And uh, for instance, Bridget's uh, major is computer science and animation, uh, whereas Kian, your uh, major is uh, business. <laughs> business. There you go. So very far in between. And we have people who had what translation as in grad school in your cohort, right? Um, and, and so forth. So very background, absolutely. Uh, and the program places emphasis on students who are prepared for rigorous academic program and the intensive nature of the program. As Kia mentioned that it was really good to take a break out there in the rice paddy after a full week of intensive learning. Um, and then in your application, it's important to show that you can succeed on the program. And that includes addressing your ability to study intensively, your skills at adapting to a group program setting where you're not making all the decisions and your cultural flexibility and maturity. Um, you should show how you are motivated to pursue language study and that you will continue your studies even after you return to the United States. Um, but of course, this doesn't mean that your campus has to offer courses in language you choose, but you should have a plan um, on how you will continue to learn and use the language in the future in your application. And then finally, you need to make a clear connection between the language you wish to study and your academic or professional career goals. So again, application is open now and available online. So you should, if you haven't already, you should start your application today right after this webinar. Um, and it has to be submitted no later than 5 p.m. Pacific time and 8 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday, November 17th. Every year we have students who try to submit their applications at the very last minute and miss the deadline. So please don't let this be you. And it will take few, um, few minutes, if not longer, to actually submit the application because there are a number of different boxes to click and different things for you to review before full uh, submitting the application. So don't corner yourself. Um, and then in January, every applicant will be notified of whether or not they will, be, uh, they will advance to the semifinal round of selection. And then this notification is done by email. So make sure you include a valid email address in your application and check your spam filters. And then those who advance to the semifinal round can expect to be notified in early March or <clears throat> on whether they have been selected for the award or chosen to be an alternate. Uh, students who are selected for the award will have about two weeks uh, to either accept or decline the offer. All right, so thank you again for taking the time to join us this afternoon. And we're going to, uh, we're going to go through questions in the order uh, they've come in through the Q&A window. Uh, but then we also, also want to point out that our contact information should now show on the window screen. Um, and you can call or email us if you have any questions about the program or the application. And we, can also have, uh, we also have put a lot of time into creating resources for applicants. So we definitely encourage you to visit our website at clscholarship.org and read through the information provided there. Um, more often than not, you are not the first person with that particular question. And we hope you can find some of the uh, answers there. 
Also, we have um, social media channels, so feel free to follow them. Um, now I'm going to ask uh, Bridget and Kian to turn their videos on just so that people know that we're people too here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hey. It's not allowing me oh, to. It says unable to start video. What? Let me, let me. Let me make you both a host and see if that works. No. No? <laughs> what? Mine's oh, <laughs> we go. Mine says unable to start video. You can't start your video because the host has stopped it. What? No. <laughs> it's okay. I'm here in spirit. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why? Uh -huh. That is so weird. Um, because I I don't have any other menu button I can do to. Uh, <laughs> oh well. It's okay. No worries. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm Sorry, Bridget. Uh, All so good. Weird. Okay. Cool. I'm gonna go ahead and read out uh, some of the questions. Um, that is specifically asking question to you two uh, first. Um, so any one of you can um, take it away. Um, so there were questions asking, how did you make your application stand out? Or what you think stood out in your application? Um, um, I guess I can answer first. Um, I think like what Sejong was mentioning before, you really like in your application, you really want to tie like how Japanese will like relate to like your future career goals. Um, and then also I think something that can help to make your application competitive is how you learning Japanese would benefit others in the future. Um, because it's great like if you want to learn Japanese and then you'll go do the specific thing and it will really benefit only you. Um, but I think CLS is really interested in also hearing about how you learning Japanese would possibly benefit others. Um, and then also I think um, something that can maybe like would also help is just like being clear about like your reasoning, I guess, for like studying Japanese and then how you're going to like continue to do that. Yeah, um, I think that's really good advice. Uh, if I remember correctly, for me, I made a specific effort to, to, you know, we were talking earlier about like if you are saying you're adaptable uh, or, you know, um, that kind of thing, you should have something to back it up. In my case, um, I kind of, I, if I remember correctly, I exemplified why I felt, you know, uh, sort of my, my hunger for wanting to go to the context environment and learn, um, you know, about Japan and uh, about Japanese uh, in context. And a part of the, the way I did that was, by drawing parallels between, you know, aspects of Japanese culture, um, aspects of, you know, my uh, Persian culture, you know, from my household and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And, and just drawing on specific examples to show, you know, what fascinates me about Japan um, and, you know, what I have yet to learn. Um, and so I, I think, you know, kind of just reiterating what we talked about earlier, uh, you know, drawing out um, those concrete examples and, and really, you know, laying them out to you know, accurately portray who you are, if that makes sense. Great. Um, I know some people have uh, typed questions in the chat box. Um, we're going through the questions on the Q&A. So if you don't mind retyping it in the Q&A, that would be lovely. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kian and Bridget. I'm going to go through some of the more, I think, administrative and boring part of the questions real quick. Okay. Will the summer 21, uh, 2021 program be virtual opportunity? What does the visa situation look like with COVID? And I know there's a few more questions like this. Um, uh, we mentioned in the presentation that there is a possibility the program will go virtual depending on uh, the situation. We monitor travel advisory very closely and work with the uh, Department of State, of course, um, because health and safety comes uh, first. First, indeed. Um, so if there is a decision uh, on uh, one of the two or we're planning for both um, and if once there is a decision students who are selected and have accepted the award will be notified immediately just to give you an idea on timeline this year um, our Chinese and Korean program was suspended in late January 
and then the rest of the program, because of the uh, travel advisory going up to four, uh, were all suspended and students were notified in March, if that helps in terms of a timeline. But then again, I wish I have the crystal ball with all the answers. Unfortunately, my ball is not as, I guess, clear as anyone else's. It's the same. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, we're monitoring. We will be sharing updates with our uh, finalists um, when there is a decision. Uh, but the answer is we're preparing for both. All right. And then is there a minimum amount of kanji we should know? How much kanji will we learn in the program? I think this would Definitely be uh, 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 something that can come from experience. Yeah, if I may start, um, no, there isn't like, you know, a set amount of kanji you have to come in knowing. However, it will help you a lot to know as many as you can. So um, reviewing and studying, um, you know, everything that you've done before, um, you know, I think that that will go a long way to help you. I remember there was one student on the program, um, you know, I believe he came in with the least amount of kanji, but he came out and probably he made the most improvement out of anyone, um, in my opinion. And so, you know, not, not to say, you, again, you don't need to, but um, it would just, it might help you. Um, and you do a lot of kanji learning, um, and I feel like the curriculum's probably changed since we were in the program. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's also incorporated in your regular, you know, studies outside of kanji class as well. So it's a part of, it's a part of the program for sure. Yeah, I'm gonna just chime in real quick that there is, I think, generally speaking, this is generalizing, um, two school of thought in kanji learning in the US in Japanese teaching. Um, some teachers are more inclined that speaking, being able to, you know, communicate is more important. So, you know, spending a lot of time in studying kanji may not be as important for them. Um, and then there's another school of thought where, you know, you have to be proper, properly learning kanji on the same level as you speak um, and then put emphasis on that. At least my sensei in the community college I worked uh, before CLS job was like that. So we spend a lot of time in class. Um, and I have to say there is definitely a tendency in Japanese education in Japan um, to pay attention to kanji learning for sure. So you will, I think definitely uh, you could be taken aback, but certainly the amount of kanji you may be introduced and expected to know or expected to memorize um, uh, throughout the program might be higher uh, than um, what you may have experienced in formal classes uh, learning here. Uh, but like Kian said, there is no set number, but certainly knowing some or knowing uh, quite a bit will help you excel um, on the program for sure. Yeah. Uh, Bridget, did you have anything to add to that? No, Kian answered that perfectly. Great. All right, next question. Ah, another uh, wonderful. Um, how can we make our application stand out if we've never been abroad? Um, now, I know Kian's been to Japan before participating on the program as a trip, right? Uh, yeah, it was just a trip. Right, right, right. So um, we do have, and Kian, you can add after I quickly sort of mm -hmm. wrap things up. Um, so we always get this question, if I have study abroad uh, experience, is that bad for me? Or if I have no study abroad experience, is that bad for me? I'd say the answer is neither. You're, you can make a case out of uh, not having study abroad um, experience, that this is the opportunity, or having the study abroad uh, experience, saying that you're ready for the, the new challenges uh, the CLS program may present. Uh, but there is no um, make or break situation where just because you have study abroad experience or not have study abroad experience that you will uh, be selected for the program. I, not sure if that makes sense then Kian you might want to add a little bit. Yeah um, no I think that's totally accurate. Um, one I mean w at either way you lean um, you have studied abroad or you have gone abroad or haven't at all um, can be made into a strength. So uh, one person who was you know who's on the CLS alumni ambassador uh, you know she's, she's one of the CLS alumni ambassadors uh, who's very inspiring um, you know, she grew up in a place where, you know, she did CLS Korean and she grew up in a place where there was, you know, nobody speaking Korean. She didn't even really know, you know, what Korean language was until, you know, she kind of ran into it um, through some form of media. Uh, and I think that's a strength in and of itself, because if you're very passionate about learning a language and you've gone so far on your own to, you know, make that effort and to, you know, actually learn um, and you 
really just need that extra, you know, step to, to go abroad when you might not have the resources or, you know, it's not super convenient for you to do so or, or something along those lines, um, you know, to, to really strengthen on the, the you know, skills you've uh, made an effort to build upon yourself, then I think that's a strength. Um, if you've gone abroad, you have some sense of, you know, the, um, you know, and navigating a new context environment. Um, and, uh, you know, you can speak on that as well. So I think either way, you can turn it into a strength. Thank you, Kian. Um, I'm going to answer two questions real quick. Um, do we stay in, in our homes, home countries uh, if we do stay online? If the program goes virtual, yes, you will be studying in your home, uh, home country as in the US. The program is for US citizens, so yes, US national and citizens. Um, is this 2021 program also be in Okayama? Yes, even if it goes virtual, it would be uh, hosted by Okayama University for our current planning. Um, people say you're a summer program, you only work in summer. Actually, that's not true. We do a lot of planning between summers. Um, so in fall and winter is when everything gets decided and then students who are selected in spring will be notified in terms of their uh, site placement, where the program will be held or if it's online, who's going to hold the program and so forth. So you would have an update as fi uh, finalists who are selected in spring. Okay, is there also an opportunity to do homestay instead of dorm housing for the entirety of the state? So our uh, housing situation for each site um, is same, remains same for across all students. So for instance, Kian and Bridget did not have a choice between host family stay and dorm. It's not that they chose it. Everyone in their cohort basically had same uh, housing situation of having host family visits in the, on the weekends um, and then staying in the dorm altogether during the, uh, the uh, work week, I don't know, during the, day, during the regular weekdays. Uh, I thought I saw on the website that the students who were accepted to 2020 program can apply again due to the programs being uh, held virtually. Will those students who were accepted before be given priority for the 2020 intake? No, so they they are uh, eligible to apply for 2021 program, but that doesn't mean that they will have priority over uh, students who have not applied or was, were accepted for 2020 program or just applying new for 2021. So they would be competing uh, altogether. It's just that students who may have graduated and no longer eligible will still have eligibility um, uh, will still be allowed to apply for the program for 2021 because the program uh, had converted to a virtual program. Mm -hmm. Does this program support international students studying in the in US? Unfortunately, our program is um, the eligibility, one of the eligibility requirement is uh, for you to have a US citizenship or a US national. If you have more questions about um, the eligibility, feel free to check out our website. Uh, there is a section about applying and then eligibility. All right, um, how many students apply and how many are accepted? What's the acceptance rate? We always get this question. We don't release language by language uh, acceptance rate because we are critical languages scholarship and our languages, there's a very specific number of students who study the language in the US. So depending on the scholarship situation availability and a number of different reasons, those numbers fluctuate. But all in all, all together for the entirety of 15 languages, we typically receive about 5,000 applications every year and have um, scholarship spots available for about 500 students. So it's about 10, 10, 10% acceptance ratio. Uh -huh. As a quarter school, our year ends mid-June. And so knowing the tentative dates for the summer program are important for our applicants. Do you know when Japan's tentative start date will be announced? Um, so our program, um, program dates are announced to the finalist when they are notified. Um, so again, going back to the, oh, summer program, you guys have fun on fall and winter. Actually not, we're planning on those program dates and uh, details of the programming um, over the course of fall and winter. So it's being decided. Um, but usually for Japan, uh, program dates are, um, so we just, uh, we can't really pinpoint it at this point, uh, but program uh, come within the uh, June and the uh, August uh, bracket. I think that's the most um, accurate information I can share at this time. Thank you. 
Does non-competitive eligibility have a time limit? For example, with Peace Corps volunteers, non-competitive eligibility is good for about one year. Yes, non-competitive eligibility status is basically same uh, for CLS as well. It's uh, good for one year. But if the hiring agency agrees to honor it, you can have it extended up to three years for reasons like studying and finishing a degree. For example, let's say Kian is applying for a government position and um, but after he graduates, uh, which would where your Kian's non-competitive eligibility started in 2019 fall. So actually, I think it expired technically now, right? Technically, uh, but from my understanding, like you said, if the agency decides to accept it once I graduate, you know, because I said I was studying up until now, then, you know, I think that's exactly. Yeah, so let's say Kian had graduated and then applied for a position, government position, and appeal that I have non-competitive eligibility. I couldn't use it right away after the CLS program because I was finishing my degree. And if the agency says, okay, we'll understand that, we'll honor that, then it gets to be extended. But it's a decision made by the hiring agency, so there's really no other process you need to do to extend that eligibility. It seems they reduced the recommendations form from two to one from last year. I have my Japanese professor and a professor who could speak of my work ethic right for me. Would Who would you recommend write in one recommendation for this round? That's a great uh, question. Um, actually, I'm just going to ask Kian and Bridget uh, in terms of who were the people wrote recommendation before adding my, uh, my thoughts to this question. Sure. Bridget, would you like to go first? Yeah, for sure. I also got a recommendation from my Japanese professor. Um, and then I got a recommendation from my advisor who understood my abilities in computer science and animation. Yeah, um, I got a recommendation from my Japanese professor and um, from a previous internship I had had prior to the program. Um, but if you, I mean, you know, now that there's only one required, um, I would say I have a student who's interested in doing CLS Arabic at my school. She asked me the same question. And so the advice I gave her was choose whoever can speak to your competencies the best. Um, it would be better in my, from my view, it'd be better if the Japanese professor, you know, likes you or, you know, has you guys have good rapport or can speak um, on, on your behalf or to your competencies well. Uh, I, I would lean towards them writing the paper. Um, however, you know, I think at the end of the day, whoever can, can you know, speak to, to your competencies the best, um, specifically those that CLS are, are, is looking for, that's who I would recommend write your paper. Yeah, um, so as Kian and Bridget both said, yeah, if uh, you have someone who could talk about your competency, that's great. Um, also, if you have someone who could talk about work ethics, that's great too. Um, and uh, so because uh, we have reduced the recommendations to one, um, it would be really up to you um, to make a choice between the, the uh, language professor and someone who knows your work ethics. Uh, but what would be important is, who you have uh, more experience of working together um, and uh, who knows you as a person in addition to your academic success um, would be really important in terms of speaking of your, um, you know, your ability to adjust to the program and also be successful candidate. Uh, how long does the non, yeah, I think we answered that question. Um, is there a different consideration for undergraduate and graduate students? So yes, we welcome both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, and um, in terms of consideration, when our selection committee review your um, application, um, certainly there will be a consideration if you're a graduate student uh, in terms of connecting your career goals to um, in the application or perhaps your the, the path that you have taken to study the language. They would certainly be interested in seeing more concrete uh, end goal and sort of more sort uh, more developed essays in the uh, application um, that is suitable for your level of education. So was CLS Stir Japanese last summer held online? So CLS Japanese last summer was suspended. And then currently the program is uh, being held, offered virtually uh, this fall. 
Did you guys use previous experiences studying abroad, for example, in your essays? Do you have experience? Mm -hmm. I talked about, um, I just traveled, but I talked about how like when I traveled, it was, I was in Japan while my friend was doing CLS Korean and um, it, I really wanted to strengthen my Japanese, but it was frustrating that I didn't have the tools he had while he was on CLS Korean. So I appealed to that. I appealed to the tools that I wish I had um, and, you know, said that basically I, I want to, you know, have them, you know, and use them if possible to, you know, strengthen my skills. Yeah, and for me, um, the only, I think I only mentioned that during the resilience part, I actually had studied abroad in Japan ever before, but I had studied abroad in China. So I talked about how I like, was able to like communicate with knowing like zero Chinese um, through like gesturing and stuff as a way to like, show my like resilience, I guess. Um, so I feel like, even if you like, didn't have experience studying abroad, you can still like, show resilience, maybe in like something you've done in the US or something like that. Yes, yeah, so if you have um, experience, certainly it would be interesting to learn what, learn from the selection committee um, on what kind of experience that was and how it had, you know, um, influenced you as a candidate. Uh, but if you don't have a study abroad experience, there must be other experiences that you want to bring into your essays. Yes. Great. Um, in the event that it will be a virtual program, can you describe a bit about fall 2020 model? Yeah, so we maintain uh, the major components of the program uh, to have it transferred virtually. So there's the classes um, and then there's also language partner meetings that's being uh, taking place virtually because of uh, the situation. Uh, but that component also comes um, to uh, online. Also, there's individual consultation, so office hours, but a little bit more of individual individualized instruction for students, um, either bi-weekly or weekly. Um, and then there might be pre-recorded uh, asynchronous class that you will take um, so that you would, we could fill in the, uh, some of the gaps uh, that students might have. Um, and then language partner, and then there's cultural activities that will come on an online program. Yes, so those are the components. Unfortunately, it's hard to, um, you know, uh, bring you the host family. Um, so that would, uh, that component does not come uh, on board um, for the virtual version of the program. Uh, language, uh, you said language ability is evaluated after acceptance, correct? Yeah, so your language proficiency will be tested through our pre-program oral proficiency interview. Um, and then when you arrive at the program site, uh, your teachers and staff will evaluate your current level of uh, language ability to place you to classes. But these evaluation is not for the sake of testing to see if you are actually at the self-assessed level. And if you're not at the self-assessed level that we would drop you, it's for your benefit in terms of us finding the right class for you to attend and join um, so that you would have maximum gains in the program. Answer that one. Uh, 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 I'm a graduate student. Will that be a detriment to my application? No, uh, we welcome graduate students to apply. And uh, as I mentioned in the earlier question, yes, so as a graduate student in the education level, whether it's a master's degree or a doctoral degree, we would, uh, the selection committee would certainly expect a certain level of um, uh, developedness in your essay compared to, let's say, a community college student or a undergraduate student. Do you need to be a full-time student to apply for this program? Um, so uh, the, that's an eligibility question. So if you don't mind specifically sharing with us in the email uh, or call us and say, explain uh, uh, what your status is in terms of at the time of application right now in the fall 2020, we would be able to give you a more concrete answer on that one. But yes, um, the, uh, the idea is that you are enrolled in a US accredited institution at the time of application. I answered that one. Uh, so this 
session will not be emailed. The session will be online, available on YouTube. Um, but uh, you will be able to have link click the link in the events page uh, for you to join this um, to view this session again online. So it won't be emailed, but it will be available in our website. There is a chat. Can freshmen apply? Yes, absolutely. Yes, uh, and uh, because the webinar is being recorded, absolutely feel free to share this opportunity with others uh, who may be interested, um, who weren't able to attend. Uh, by they, they can come to our webpage again in the events uh, section and then watch the webinar again. Uh, we have an applicant who has said that uh, he or she has disability. How should I address this in your application? So for applicants with disability, um, so in the application, if you want to, you can certainly uh, discuss that and include it in your essay um, um, to share um, the aspects of that. Uh, if it, it is something that you think is important aspect of your uh, who you are and also have examples to share that is relevant to the prompts. Uh, but then once you're selected an accepted port for the program. Um, between acceptance and then start of the program, Kian and Bridget remembers there's a number of different documents that you have to fill out and submit. Uh, and one of them is disability accommodation form. So what you would do is um, fill out that form for us uh, when you decide to accept the award. Um, and you would have it also signed by your disability uh, service office on campus so that we know what kind of uh, accommodation you are provided at your home institution. And then we work with that document with you and our partner over in Okayama to discuss what are the accommodations that is necessary, what is the situation in Okayama that is valuable, uh, sorry, valid and uh, available. And if there uh, things are not available, how can we make the situation so that you are able to participate on the program without difficulties? Um, and then also on the program, we would have resident and director who would support you throughout um, to make sure that you are able to attend the program uh, to the fullest. Um, but that's how we would approach. So if you want to, yes, you can include it in your application. All right, we still have a few open questions. So if you're a grad student, uh, you're still allowed to apply for it, yes. Um, Kian, did we have graduate student in the cohort? Yeah. John, John was graduate student, right? Yeah, we had a couple. Mm -hmm. Yep, so we definitely welcome and have uh, finalists who have made uh, as graduate student. So if the program is virtual, is, it, is virtual in Japan or in the US? So it would be both. Your teachers and program staff will be in Japan and you will be in the US. So how many students typically accepted to the cohort? How many of, of how many people were there in your cohort? Uh, 21, 22. I don't remember the exact number, but it was in the low 20s. I think it was 26. 26. Really? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. It's all good. <laughs> Uh, typically, it's under 30 uh, and somewhere in the low 20s to uh, higher 20s. Yes, somewhere in between mid 20s, I guess. Yeah. Um, is planning to study abroad in the future going to hurt or help you? Um, it depends on how you include it in your um, essay, I have to say. If you have plans for future study abroad, but have a ways to link it to... Um, so if it's uh, a piece that is necessary to explain about your aspirations or a specific, to address specific essay prompt, then certainly you're welcome to include it. But if you just include the study abroad uh, future plans for its own sake, that probably is not a good idea. I remember Bridget adding this uh, comment, I think, when she was talking about her experience looking at other people's essay this um, cycle. Uh, but yeah, if you're going to have it there, there should be a good reason why you're talking about your future study abroad plans in the application. 
I want to make sure I heard and read correctly, but for the application, there's only one recommendation required. Yes, there's only one recommendation required, and it's not a recommendation letter, it's a recommendation form. I started some simple information in the application form, and it said two letters of recommendation, so I'm a little confused about this. We are requiring one recommendation this year. Yes, it used to be two, uh, but this starting this year, it's one. This might be a good question for uh, Kian and Bridget. So hello, you guys talked a bit about how to present yourself well when writing your essays, mentioning the need to be authentic. I actually was planning to join the Air Force as a translator after graduation, uh, graduating though. Um, would you guys recommend not talking about this so I don't seem ingenuine? Uh I think you should definitely mention your future plans. If that's your future plan, you should definitely mention it. Um, and then it seems like it's a future plan that's related to studying Japanese. So I think that's something that you should definitely include in your application. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. Okay, um, I have one student asking question in the uh, chat box. So if you have question, it's best if you could put it in the Q&A box because sometimes we miss that. But just as a follow up, there was a question about applying as a freshman. Uh, and then now there's a follow up saying, I'm wondering if incoming freshmen can apply as high school seniors. So you have to be enrolled in a US degree granting program in the higher education institution. Um, so if you're a high school senior at the time of application, you are not eligible to apply. Okay. Um, are there any academic opportunities outside of the program for the people who have research interest? Um, in fact, um, because the CLS scholarship, the very purpose of it is for you to be immersed in the language and culture studies, um, you, are act uh, you are actually not allowed to do independent research. Also, um, your visa uh, may conflict with the idea of research so that there are countries where you're required specific visa to be able to conduct research, let alone um, other aspects of the research that you have to um, be approved of uh, at the host institute. So no, you're not allowed to do research on the program. You may make connections while on the program to be able to conduct research after the program, but not on the program. Uh, I have already studied in, abroad in Japan. How will that affect my application? I think we answer that. Um, if you apply but don't get accepted, can you still apply for the next year? Yes, absolutely. And just so you know, I don't know if you um, can't, I, I'm sorry, um, but do you mind sharing a little bit about, you know, experience of applying for more than once? No, yeah. Um, so I applied um, after my freshman year, I couldn't apply for Japanese, but uh, one of my good friends uh, who actually ended up getting the, the scholarship for CLS Korean encouraged me to also apply for that, um, you know, kind of saying, well, if you have two languages under your belt, why not kind of deal. So um, I, uh, I, you know, I applied um, and I did not get in, um, but that's totally okay because, you know, to be honest, it was reflective of how you know, my interest uh, in Korean, it, it was there, but it, it was relatively, you know, it wasn't based on a whole lot of previous study or, you know, anything like that. So I, I think it was kind of uh, organic and natural that I did not get, you know, accepted for that. But, you know, um, after a year, I got a year of Japanese under my belt, um, you know, and applied uh, at the intermediate level with a lot more to speak on. And um, I, I think that showed in the application. So it goes back to the whole thing with you know, authenticity being important in your application. Thank you so much. Um, we have a student asking, if you're accepted to CLS, can you also apply to the mixed scholarship offered by Japan Ministry of Education? Um, so I always tell you, these scholarships are not mutually exclusive. Apply if you're eligible, for sure. Um, and when the ball is in your court uh, for you to make a decision, that's when you can make that decision to, you know, accept one of the two scholarships if you are accepted to both. But again, um, these opportunities are not uh, mutually exclusive. I know in the past, our pre-departure orientation uh, sometimes overlapped, which did put um, uh, students who are applying for a mixed scholarship uh, sort of in a, uh, have to make a choice uh, for their interviews. Uh, but we're working with the uh, uh, Japanese embassy to uh, try and make sure that the schedule does not overlap. So you are, uh, if you make it to the round for the interviews that you will be able to do the interview but also participate on the CLS scholarship. 
if we do not get in this year, maybe we apply next year. I don't feel confident enough in my language proficiency yet, but I want to work towards it. I'd say yes, apply. Um, it's a learning experience and next year you'll actually have something to work from rather than starting from scratch for your application. Uh, for intermediate and advanced levels, do they roughly correspond to JLPT levels? Hmm. What do you think, Bridget? Um, I feel like uh, it, it's probably ch changes depending on the curriculum maybe, but within CLS, like when you do get accepted, you take a placement test to place you into classes at the Okayama University or the home university. Um, and for our program, we were split into four levels. Um, and then I was in the fourth level. So that was the like most advanced class, I guess. Um, I had passed the JLPT N2. Um, and then the textbooks we were using were sort of like taking people from around N2 level-ish to like N1 level-ish. Um, however, I feel like, like it's not an exact match by, no, by any means at all. Um, and also like even within that like advanced level class, like I was probably the dumbest person in that class. Um, so like even within the class, the level really varies. Um, and then also I feel like out the outside like cultural excursions, like if you already at like N1 level, um, that you can definitely like challenge yourself there as well as like in the classroom, like speaking with like important people in like Kago um, or like doing like reading articles that are like difficult and then bringing it to the teacher in class and things like that. Um, but yeah, I feel like in no way is it a like one-to-one -one match with the like JLPT level, JLPT levels. Additionally, the JLPT does not cover speaking. Um, and I think definitely within the cohort, like speaking ability varies wildly. Um, also, I didn't know Japanese had tones. I learned that in class. Um, and I'm still learning that. But yeah, I feel like the, the level, like it's, it's not like set in stone. Like these, this corresponds to this. And, that's just, that's just how I felt in, in my experience on the program in 2019. <laughs> Great. Ikian, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I think that's, uh, she hit it right on the head. Um, it, it doesn't, there's no direct translation between the level of the class you're in and the JLPT. JLPT. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you everyone for your patience with us. It's uh, past 20 minutes from the hour. So we're going to wrap things up for the day. Thank you very much. And if you had missed, uh, missed the earlier part of the webinar, we will definitely upload this on our events page. So feel free to check it out. Um, if you have any questions, again, feel free to email us or call us. I'd be very happy to answer those. Um, thank you again for joining us and uh, you guys have a great day. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. See you guys soon. Yeah.